everyone. Good morning and welcome to yet another session of the NPTEL course Postmodernism and Literature. Today's lecture is a continuation of the previous lecture where we started discussing Borges' story, The Garden of Walking Paths. We had been trying to look at uh, the story and locate it in a postmodernist uh, uh, reading and also we began with this understanding that though the short story was published way before the postmodernist moment uh, officially was inaugurated, we begin to uh, understand that there are so many elements which could be identified with postmodernism in this uh, short story, The Garden of Walking Paths. Let me give you a very quick recap of the plot of the story, The Garden of Walking Paths. The uh, protagonist and the narrator is uh, Yusun and the story is also narrated in the form of a deposition. It also in that sense negates all kinds of conventional attitudes towards uh, the storytelling and also about narrative techniques. Yusun is a German spy who is currently located in London and his uh, uh, spy cover has been uh, blown and he has now been exposed. So he is also fleeing to escape being murdered, being shot dead by uh, Richard Madden who is a captain. And he also in this process decides to go and meet with Dr. Stephen Albert and that's also the turning point, the twist in the tale as uh, one could say. And he meets with uh, Dr. Stephen Albert who is also a renowned sinologist and uh, as the story progresses we also get to know that Dr. Stephen Albert has also been working on Sui Penn's uh, novel which was also incidentally titled The Garden of Walking Paths and uh, you soon and, in, and again very coincidentally Sui Penn also happens to be the grandfather, the great grandfather of Yu Sun. So they have this meeting, they talk about uh, the bifurcations in time, the bi bifurcations in space, how both of them have been endlessly fascinated by this novel and the labyrinth that this Chinese ancestor Sui Pen had proposed to create. And uh, just when Yu Sun sees Richard Madden approaching him, he murders uh, Stephen Albert and the rest is uh, history. And we also get to know towards the end of the story that a city named Albert was bombed and that was also incidentally the city where that the weapons were stashed in uh, England. And towards the end of the story there is also the statement, I had not any other cause open to me than to kill someone of that name, that name being Albert. He does not know for no one can of my infinite penitence and sickness of the heart. The story in that sense as we have noted in the previous session, it's many things rolled into one. It's postmodernist fiction, it is a detective fiction, it's also a celebration of non-linear kind of narrating which uh, could be seen in hypertext uh, uh, narratives as well. So these were the major themes that we started identifying. The most important one being about time and infinity, it's also about text and writing process, it's also a narrative, a story which questions the existence of free will, about the choices available and about the multiple possibilities which both a life as well as a text opens up with, uh, before us. It's also at some level about betrayal and loyalty as we would see uh, in the discussion of the story today. That the garden of walking paths is also being posited as a detective fiction is something very telling. We noticed in the previous uh, lecture that uh, Borges himself identified and uh, labeled the story as a detective fiction. Detective fiction is a subgenre of crime fiction and mystery fiction and it, uh, uh, it witnessed the golden age of uh, detective novels in 1920s and 1930s and uh, one of some of the supreme examples would be Edgar Allan Poe and Agatha Christie. And in, uh, in the pattern of a detective fiction, in the narrative structure of a detective fiction, the most commonly used approach is that of a puzzle approach or the approach which has uh, now been uh, commonly known as whodunit. And uh, in, in any detective story, the way the story, the plot unfolds is also about a solution being revealed at the end and there is also a suspense which is being built and uh, that also makes this story uh, uh, racy and interesting and uh, uh, technically superb in multiple ways. But at the same time, though this genre, uh, the detective fiction was considered as an ex extremely popular medium in the beginning of the 20th century, it was also considered as inferior to other kind, other genres. It was considered as critically inferior to all other kinds of uh, genres. It was seen as an inferior uh, literary genre and this was not uh, included as part of the literary canon for a very long time. 
And this is very telling given the fact that the literary fiction of Borges also gets written in the framework of a detective fiction. And uh, later, Ambato Eco also adopts the detective genre to uh, experiment with his narrative techniques. Garden of Walking Paths had a very interesting entry to the literary world. It first appeared not in a highbrow literary academic uh, uh, journal or a, uh, a magazine, but it first appeared in a pulp fiction periodical titled Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine. So to begin with, this was a deliberate play with an inferior genre and there was a deliberate attempt to get it published in a pulp fiction periodical. But it's yet another accident of literary history that now this is considered as one of the most literary and one of the most difficult uh, stories ever written. So coming back to the framework of the detective fiction within which the story uh, The Garden of Walking Paths gets narrated, who is the detective in this uh, story? More than a person, a character within the story resolving the uh, set of events, more than a character uh, uh, solving the puzzle which the story uh, foregrounds, we find that the reader emerges as the most important detective in this process. So this can be then effectively connected with the, dis uh, with the essays that we discussed in the beginning of this course, namely The Death of the Author by Roland Barthes and What is an Author by Michel Foucault. And we also notice that in the narrative move from structuralism to post-structuralism, it is the reader who emerges as the detective. It is the reader who co-participates in this process of telling the story and who also engages in unraveling the mysteries which are part of the story. So in that sense, there is no single solution, no single uh, puzzle which gets resolved, but it's also about multiple problems and multiple resolutions which the text has to offer. And that is the infinite possibility that a text like uh, Garden, Garden of Walking Paths offers to us. So what happens to the text in this process? What about the meaning making process? We find that in this story, The Garden of Walking Paths, we find multiple authorial voices being foregrounded. For example, to begin with, we have the uh, uh, anonymous historian, there is a manuscript editor who paraphrases the uh, historical document. There is also Yusun whose deposition becomes a central part of the story. This also leaves us with this very telling uh, question, what is text? And if we look at the no, if we look at this short story, if we look at the ways in which it engages with a set of texts which are real and unreal, the text is also the story is also asking this question about how to define a text. So in multiple in multiple ways, the story itself is about the process of writing. The short story does not have a story of its own unless it engages with other processes of narr narration and other ways of uh, telling uh, different kinds of stories. To locate this discussion in a more effective way, it would be important to recall the earlier uh, sections where we also discussed about rhizomes, which were uh, discussed by Gilles Deleuze and Felix Gattari. And we also spoke about the rhizomatic and hypertextual environments, uh, such as the World Wide Web, which were discussed as postmodern, decentralized, and kinetic worlds. We spoke about what, how rhizomes, in a certain way, completely negated and questioned all kinds of uh, authority and also any kinds of hierarchy. And unlike uh, an approach which is top down, rhizomes existed in a parallel. Uh, a way without any sense of hierarchy, without any kind of a top-down approach. And this was also seen in the way in which a rhizome could be effectively uh, compared to a ginger where there are these multiple openings and multiple entry points and there are a number of uh, connectors that we can see but it would be difficult to uh, uh, identify where the part of a ginger begins or where it ends. So it was not about the beginnings, middle and the uh, endings, it was more about the connections and the different possibilities of connectors that such a uh, structure would lend itself to. So if we begin to see the story, the Garden of uh, Walking Paths as a rhizome, we notice that the story has multiple entry and exit points. It does not adopt a beginning, a top down approach. In the, on the other hand, it is more about the interrelatedness between the sequence of events and the interconnectedness between the characters. And there are also no hierarchies and no binaries. If, uh, uh, if you are asked 
who is the central protagonist, who is the hero of this uh, uh, story, it would be difficult to identify one. At various levels, if we access the story from multiple entry points, it would be possible to locate all the characters as central characters because all of them also have a different story to tell. There are also these different possibilities that the story offers and it is only just a coincidence, it is only just a uh, 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 just a literary accident that the story foregrounds certain parts which uh, can be taken. The story is also about these multiple bifurcating parts that each character could have chosen, could have followed, but it is also about the many uh, choices and the many possibilities that they did not choose to take. So in that sense, the Garden of Walking Paths needs to be seen as a rhizomatic text which offers us multiple entry and exit points which defines all kinds of hierarchies and all kinds of binary ways in which narratives, characters and even the act of storytelling can be talked about. The image of the labyrinth is a recurrent image in Borges stories and even in this, uh, even in this uh, Garden of Walking Paths we find a, a very uh, a, a pertinent presence of the image of the labyrinth and this is also instrumental in making sense of uh, the story. Uh, Borges was so uh, preoccupied in the uh, in, in, in creating and recreating the image of the labyrinth in most of his stories. We find him publishing an entire collection of short stories titled uh, The Labyrinth in 1962. So uh, when we examine the Garden of Walking Paths within the context of a labyrinth, we find we are being introduced to the Walking Paths in Sweepen's novel which is also a fictional work. It is this not a real work that uh, Borges is alluding to but it is also a book which has not been written but Borges pretends that the uh, work as well as multiple interpretations of that do exist. We are also introduced to forking paths leading to Dr. Albert's uh, life and Dr. Albert's house and there are also these choices which are being placed before the central character Yusun that could also be seen as different possibilities or different forking paths which the text talks about. So when we see the garden as a labyrinth, the short story The Garden of Forking Paths as a labyrinth, we are being introduced to two kinds of spaces, one a textual labyrinth and also a physical labyrinth. And we find that the textual labyrinth is more complicated and more complex than the physical labyrinth because in the case of a textual labyrinth, one is not too sure, not clear where the walls are, where the center is and there is an impossibility of knowing just like a rhizome where the beginning, the end and the entry points or the exit points of the textual labyrinth lies. So uh, uh, at some level Borges by introducing us to the textual labyrinth as well as the physical labyrinth, he is also introducing us to a conceptual symbolic space. And uh, so, uh, looking at the labyrinth from such an angle, it is also like an invitation to explore an unknown space. And it is for the same reason that this story is one among the uh, one among those stories which always demand a second reading and if you have already taken a look at the uh, short story or even if you are yet to take a look at, look at the short story, you would also realize that the first reading will certainly demand a second reading from you because that is when the possibility of analyzing the text, that is when the possibility of identifying the uh, different forking paths with the narrative offers is, lies. Taking the discussion on labyrinth uh, a little further, Borges also introduces to this concept of a labyrinthine time and that is also an imaginary setting. In his own words, it encompasses past and future and extends to the stars. So uh, we are also wondering whether Borges is using the labyrinth as an allegory for time because one of the prominent themes of this novel, uh, one of the prominent themes of this story is also about time and infinity. It is also possible to see the story itself as a labyrinth because there are many narratives diverging and converging in this, uh, uh, in, in this single story and there are also these ways in which one could begin to identify the possibilities of bifurcating in time. For instance, if you take a uh, look at some of the episodes such as uh, uh, Yusin choosing to flee, there is always this option of Yusin not fleeing, not escaping and not taking the train. And uh, Borges is also alluding that there is a possibility to write a story about that as well. There is a possibility to talk about another time frame, another space where Yusin is exercising a set of other choices. And also towards the end, the moment 
Yusun makes this decision to murder Stephen Albert, he is also exercising this choice of not inhabiting another time frame, of not, uh, not deciding to do it otherwise. So this story, by foregrounding the many choices the various characters are making, are all, is also alerting us to the possibility of an alternate set of uh, uh, time frames, an alternate set of uh, choices which are also available to us. But again, there is an impossibility for the same character to inhabit all of these time uh, slots and all of these uh, uh, specialities at the same time, which is what the narrative also tries to challenge and expose us to. This now brings us to another important aspect of postmodernism, which has also been linked quite pertinently with this uh, story, Garden of Walking Paths. Garden of Walking Paths, as well as most of the writings by Borges, has been largely seen as uh, uh, part of uh, the magic uh, realist uh, narration. Magic realism is also known as magical realism or marvelous realism, to quote M.H. Abrams. Uh, it is a sharply edged realism in representing ordinary events and descriptive details together with fantastic and dreamlike elements, as well as with materials derived from myth and fairy tales. So it has also been referred to as fabulism. So what exactly is magic realism? It's a deadpan and prosaic acceptance of the supernatural or the fantastical and the fantastic elements are treated as possible and realistic. They are not consciously being shown as supernatural or fantastic elements. To uh, quote Matthew Stretcher, magic realism is what happens when a highly detailed realistic setting is invaded by something too strange to believe. So here's the key to understanding uh, um, a magic realism. It is too strange to believe, but at the same time, it is placed within a very ordinary realistic setting. And it's important to uh, understand that magic realism is very different from realism, surrealism, and fantasy. Fantasy is something which play, takes place in an unreal world, in an unreal setting. For example, uh, The Lord of the Rings by uh, uh, Tolkien. And uh, surrealism could be identified as a certain kind of a deliberate rejection of realism and an engagement with a, uh, uh, certain kinds of works, such as Dali's uh, painting, Salvador Dali, the modernist, uh, uh, mo the modernist painter. And realism is something that we are all familiar with. It is uh, more or less a real, uh, more or less a realist depiction of life in any kind of art and uh, narration. And magic realism could also be seen as a post-colonial marginalizing of a quaint fiction away from serious literature. And magic, magic realism has often been associated with Latin American literature and uh, Salman Rushdie, uh, Garcia Marquez all have been uh, uh, related, associated with the various techniques of magic uh, realism. They've been seen as supreme practitioners of magic realist uh, fiction. And uh, in magic realism, unlike surrealism, uh, realism and fantasy, we are talking about a world which appears much like our own, much like the real world. For example, in uh, uh, Franz Kafka's uh, Metamorphosis, we have this central protagonist, Grigor uh, Samsa, who wakes up in the morning and finds that he has turned into a giant insect. Or uh, Marquis' short story, A Very Old Man with Enormous Wings, where the character Pelayo finds an angel with huge buzzard wings, dirty and half-plucked, in his courtyard after rainstorm. So there are these extraordinary supernatural things which happen in the real setting. And most of the other settings, the rest of the world looks very much like our own and only these supernatural elements stand out. And they're not being made to stand out because they're also presented as matter of fact, uh, more or less uh, real uh, events. So these are some of the features of magic realism. Uh, the, the narrative will have fantastical elements. It would be based in the real world settings. It would be based in a real world setting. There is a presence of authorial reticence. On the other hand, we also have an indifferent narrator who narrates in a rather unsympathetic tone. We also have uh, uh, the uh, discussion. We also have a representation of plenitude and also hybridity, which is a central postmodernist feature. But this also enables uh, the reader to access multiple planes of reality. This uh, brings us to uh, some of the examples from the story which could be related with magic realism. 
there is this anomaly of the an Asian who is a, a Yusun working as an access agent murdering an arbitrary sinologist to encode a message to Berlin. So this is a very magical realist thing because that plays with the idea of textual labyrinth, plays with the idea and certain impossibilities of time, technique and also about occurrences. And there is this, there is, uh, this uh, uh, excerpt from the story. Everyone imagined two works, to no one did it occur that the book and the maze were one and the same thing. Here uh, Dr. Stephen Albert, the sinologist, is talking about Sui Pen's unwritten novel and he is alerting us to the fact that uh, according to his observation, the novel and the labyrinth that uh, Sui Pen uh, sought to create both were one. To no one did it occur that the book and the maze were one and the same thing. So here, through the uh, narrative of the story, we are also being told that the text, the garden and the lives of the characters are becoming one. So there are certain impossibilities that the story Garden of Walking Paths deals with and those could be seen as the intervention of magic realist techniques in the narration. So how do we locate the Garden of Walking Paths as a postmodern text? It very clearly employs the techniques of metafiction. It is <coughs> self-conscious about the form. The story talks about a story within the story. While uh, Borges' story is titled The Garden of Walking Paths, we also have a, an unwritten novel by Suipin, which is mentioned in the novel, in the story, which is again titled uh, The Garden of Walking Paths. So there is a parodying or a departing from traditional techniques. That's also a deliberate thing that Borges dallies with. There is also a heightened awareness of mystery, a heightened awareness, awareness of infinite possibilities. And at the same time, there is a certain kind of political critique also which emerges uh, through the narrative. It's also decentering and subversive in certain ways. There are, uh, there's a way in which the story also prompts us to talk about certain contested notions such as nation, ethnicity, as well as hierarchy. And there is also this uh, ultimate question about whether this story is meant for a sophisticated audience. So how does a layman make sense of this uh, uh, story? Does one have to be acutely conscious about the various possibilities that the postmodern uh, uh, that the postmodern uh, world offers us to be able to make sense of this uh, story? This is also a very ambivalent dichotomous uh, question that the postmodernists uh, need to reckon with. While the story endlessly talks about the multiple possibilities and the infinite bifurca bifurcation of uh, uh, time and space, it also questions certain traditional notions attached with identity, nation, loyalty, freedom, choice, etc. There is uh, this occasion where the character Yusun is uh, made to wonder. Such a barbarous country is of no importance to me, particularly since it had degraded me by, ma by making me become a spy. Here we find Yusun questioning his own identity, his own uh, occupation and also how there are certain things that he is being forced to do just because of this imposed loyalty towards the nation and also towards a certain uh, kind of an occupation, a certain kind of a mission that he has been entrusted with. And he is also making this uh, uh, very powerful statement, I wish to prove to him that a yellow man could save his armies. There is a very direct reference to his uh, uh, ethnicity and also about the racial uh, superiority that he uh, tries to subvert and we are also being uh, uh, made to understand that Yuzun as a character perhaps has limited freedom, limited sense of choice given that he is also driven by the powerful hierarchical uh, binary based uh, understanding of identity as well as loyalty towards nation and also towards the uh, mission that he has been entrusted with. And there are also these strange coincidences that the story opens up uh, and, and introduces us to. Uh, uh, for example, take a look at this passage. He was governor of uh, Yanan and gave up temporal power to write a novel and to create a maze in which all men would lose themselves. He spent 13 years on these oddly assorted tasks before he was assassinated by a stranger. Here this passage is talking about the Chinese ancestor, the great grandfather of Yusin who's a sweepin. In this passage, we find that Dr. Stephen Albert, who is having this conversation about sweepin, who spent 13 years on oddly assorted tasks before he was assassinated by a stranger, he himself, uh, I mean uh, Stephen Albert himself gets assassinated by a stranger after having spent a number of years 
working on again uh, a set of strangely assorted tasks. And this is the kind of uh, uh, coincidences the, uh, the story is opening up to. And it's a very postmodern thing to do in the sense that it is conscious about the deliberate ways in which the story is uh, knit together. It is conscious of the uh, multiple possibilities that, that the story is throwing open before us. There are also certain clues the text leaves us with in order to uh, make better sense of the entire technique which is being used. Uh, look at this passage, such a publication was madness, again they are referring to this uh, novel which, uh, which uh, Sui Pen tried to write. The book is a shapeless mass of contradictory rough drafts, I examined it once upon a time. The hero dies in the third chapter while in the fourth he is alive. Here we are being introduced to the possibility of non-linear uh, hypertext kind of a narration which negates all sense of unity as well as coherence. It needs to be kept in mind that this story was published in the 1940s when hypertext and digital revolution had not yet arrived. In that sense, it is also a foretelling of a kind of a hypertext a technique which becomes one of the key features, one of the uh, prominent uh, narrative techniques of the postmodernist era. So to sum up, what is this garden about? Again, let us look uh, back to the text uh, for particular kinds of uh, clues. The text tells us, I leave to the various futures, not to all my garden of walking paths. This is also one of the most uh, quoted uh, passages from uh, Borges. So here we are being uh, introduced to about the possibilities of bifurcating in time and not in space about the possibilities of various futures and various times existing. But whether one is able to inhabit all of those futures and all of those times is also the question uh, the, uh, the, 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 the story opens up. And another passage, no one realized that the book and the labyrinth were one and the same. Here in fact Borges is perhaps alluding through this narration the possibility of an impossible a literary invention about infinite endings, while he is acutely conscious about the fact that such a uh, novel or such a story with infinite possibilities and infinite endings cannot be written. He does not stop himself from talking about a text which imaginarily exists, talking about a text which attempts to bifurcate in time and in space and also about how that is linked with a certain choices that one is making, certain kinds of freedom that one is invested with. And this is ultimately uh, something that the text leaves us with. Garden of Walking Paths as a story is also about the various possibilities that lie in space and time, the various impossibilities that are also part of certain narrations, the various possibilities that a postmodernist text opens up before us. Let me also leave you with a couple of questions for self-study. Attempt a critical reading of the story The Garden of Forking Paths in the context of your familiarity with hypertext and digital culture. This is also keeping in mind the fact that the uh, text predates these uh, newer notions of hypertext and digital culture which is part of the postmodernist era. Identify other works or texts which also play with the idea of time. For example, you could look at a text like Alice in Wonderland or the movie Inception or any other text where you find the uh, possibility of playing with time exists. So with this, we sum up this lecture on The Garden of Walking Path, the short story by Borges. I also again encourage you to take a look at the original short story to make better sense of the discussion that we've just had. Thank you for your time and I look forward to seeing you in the next session.